Chapter Seven of Seven Autumn Leaves from Fairyland. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Evan Smith. Seven Autumn Leaves from Fairyland by E. Cunningham. Chapter Seven. Black Sneed. On a coast of Africa called Zanzibar, there was once a boy of the name of Sneed, as black as a piece of charcoal and as mischievous as any ten white boys rolled into one. The family lived in a palm tree grove, with a palm leaf shed backed up against a rock on one side and a brook of clear water from the hills on the other. Sneed could climb like a monkey and run like an ostrich, and these two accomplishments saved him from a good many whippings for he always had some piece of mischief to atone for, and a good acacia stick with the thorns on stood ready at all times for use on his tough little back when he could be caught. At last everyone began to get tired of him. The family toes had been tied together in their sleep, the donkey pads had been stuck with thorns, salt water instead of fresh put in the coffee pot, all once too often and this family of black folks made up their minds to sell him and get rid of him. A stout old uncle who lived in a neighboring grove, and who thought it possibly a little discreditable to sell one's near relation, called to discuss the matter, and a family council was held, upon which Sneed looked down from a lofty palm tree, where he had been sent to pick coconuts and to be out of the way. The old blackie was arguing Sneed's case with great gesture and grimace, when plump came a small coconut down from on high, and striking his woolly head, pitched him into the middle of the circle on his nose. It was, of course, Sneed's work, who could not withstand the temptation of his venerable relative's convenient situation right beneath him. This convincing proof of his unfitness for civilized life settled his fate, and the next morning an Arab slave ship, happening to come coasting along, he was sold for a measure of coffee beans, and carried off, never to be seen by his affectionate family again. The little ship went coasting along, picking up likely slaves here and there, and Sneed now found out what hard work was, and how very little a black boy could live on. He had soon attracted unfavorable attention by trying, when no one was looking, to cut the halyards of the mainsail with a sharpened piece of iron, and his masters after that kept him out of mischief by keeping him at the oar. As for food, it looked as if they meant to try the experiment of his living on a day-to-day -day they brought his allowance so low. The small bark, nothing more than a large boat, was beginning to be crowded, when one afternoon, as they were coasting along the shore of a desert-looking island, a violent storm came up, and they were in great danger of foundering. The slaves were set to work bailing, and all was in confusion when Sneed, who could swim like a frog, slipped overboard and took his chance with the waves. Nobody even observed him, and after a hard struggle and with a good deal of salt water in him, he reached the shore quite exhausted. He lay on the sand till morning, and then began to look about for something to eat and drink. He had evidently come to a bad place for that. On all sides was sand, nothing but sand. It ran up into the hills inland, it bordered the blue sea as far as he could look on either hand. He climbed to the top of a hill with some difficulty, for tough as he naturally was, he was reduced to weakness by starvation. When he got there, he was rewarded by the sight of waving tops of trees, apparently growing in a hollow or valley among the hills. He staggered and crept along with just enough strength in him to reach the side of the pool that filled the bottom of the hollow and gave life to the grove of trees that surrounded it. Water was plenty, and a broken coconut only half eaten lay upon the bank, and that was quite enough to bring Sneed's hardy little body round again. He looked about and found that though the grove was small, there were both coconut and date palms and plenty of fruit upon them. He had just concluded that there was no one to eat it but him when he saw a large white monkey sitting among the branches, watching him. The monkey looked at Sneed, and Sneed looked at the monkey for some time, when the last got slowly down and, walking up, put some dates on the bank beside Sneed, without any other sign of friendliness. He sat himself a little way off, with a very composed face, while Sneed ate the dates. Sneed had never seen a white monkey, and as he ate, he was wondering how such a white hide felt to the wearer. 
After a while the monkey came nearer and began to stroke Sneed's back, and they were soon sitting side by side, each making the most of his new acquaintance. Sneed quickly recovered his strength and activity under the easy circumstances he was now in. He found the white monkey very friendly and sensible, too, as far as he could judge by actions, for he could not speak a word. They went together over the island, which proved to be half of sand and half of steep and jagged rocks, without water or plant except in the hollow, which, having a bottom of clay, held the rainwater and so gave nourishment to vegetation. This friendship continued unchecked until one hot noon, when the monkey was taking a nap, Sneed, the while, sitting idle by and wishing there was something to do. He had not satisfied his curiosity upon the subject of the monkey's white hide, and now he wondered whether his blood was red, and whether indeed he had any. A large thorn lay convenient, and Sneed began to experiment by thrusting the thorn into his thigh. There was blood, certainly, and plenty of it, and it was red, too, but Sneed had very little time to think about it, for the monkey, jumping hastily up, seized him in his strong arms and carried him up on a high rock so smooth and so steep that Sneed couldn't get down, and there he left him in the sun on a little point just large enough to sit on for two whole days and nights without anything to eat or drink. The poor little blackie nearly died, but it was a very good thing for him for when the monkey brought him down again, quite senseless, and poured some water down his throat and got his eyes open, Sneed considered and made up his mind not to prick anyone ever again. So he and the monkey lived together like two friends a long while, and little by little and with great pains the monkey learned to talk after a fashion, which was a great comfort to both, and Sneed found that his white friend was very clever and knew a great deal that had not been learned on that island. He would not say a word, however, of what had happened to him elsewhere, or how he came there, though he listened to Sneed's account of himself with interest. Sneed, who had a lively imagination, of course made himself out to be the son of a king who had been stripped by his brothers and sold into slavery on account of his many virtues. The white monkey winked hard during the story, but Sneed couldn't tell whether it was to keep his tears back or because he was sleepy. How long they would have gone on contentedly in this lonely place, it is difficult to say. But before they had become discontented, they were forced to leave it in such a sudden manner that their very dinner, plucked in the morning to save work in the hot noon, remained to spoil or be eaten by the ants. They were on the shore looking for shellfish when a rowboat full of black thieves came round the point, pounced upon them unawares, tied their hands and carried them clean away. After two or three days in the boat, where they were well kicked and cuffed and fed short, they came to land at the castle of a grisly old giant, who was a magician as well. Here they were sold to the giant's butler, who was constantly needing new hands, so many were killed off by hard work and cruel treatment. The white monkey, who now pretended he could not talk, was put into the garden to work, and Sneed was made houseboy and had to carry water and clean the rooms. Now this disagreeable giant had, locked up in a stone room in his castle, a beautiful princess whom he had stolen away from her father's house in Circassia. Sneed had to carry water to her chamber, and even the white monkey had not been such a surprise to him as this red and white beauty was when he saw her. It was an astonishment to find there were white monkeys. It was a still greater to find there were white men and women. He soon knew all about her, for the princess told him the whole story, which he in turn told at night to his friend the white monkey, for they slept together in a dog kennel. They wanted very much to help the princess, but it was a difficult matter for anyone, for this giant not only had a strong castle with high walls, but no one knew the secret of his locks, and he always kept his keys himself. Besides that, he had the winds in his service, and they had to go where he liked, and if any one ran away, he was sure to be caught. The white monkey put one finger on the side of his nose, which was his way when he considered. He had already noticed that the stable door was always locked, and that the groom went there only once a day for an hour, and then, coming out, locked it again, and the butler carried the key up to the giant. 
he had asked the gardener why their master was so careful and he answered that he had there the fastest horse in the world and therefore always kept him locked up as for the princess he kept her locked up also but always came and took the key from the lock himself after the room had been put in order the white monkey thought it all over shook his head gravely but told sneed they would see about it next day when morning came, they went out together, and the monkey picked up two small stones, one of which he gave to Sneed, and one he put in his own ear, having no other place for it. He told Sneed to put his in the lock of the princess's door as he passed through, carrying in the water. As for his own, he worked on the border of the garden next to the stable, and when the groom went in, he slipped it into the stable lock without being seen. When the groom came out, he tried in vain to lock the door, and being afraid to tell the giant, he withdrew the key, leaving the door unlocked but shut, and sent it as usual up to his master. He also could not lock the door of the princess's room when the time came, but after fuming and foaming for a while, and threatening to burn every one alive, he put his boot-jack against it, which barked like a dog if anything disturbed it, and went off. When night came and all was dark and quiet, the princess, who had been warned by Sneed, put on her bonnet and gloves, took her little bag, and sat ready for a journey. The monkey brought the horse out, all saddled and bridled, through the open stable door, while Sneed crept upstairs to open that of the princess. But when he saw the boot-jack, he did not know what to do, for if he made it bark, it would wake the giant. So he went down again to consult his friend, the white monkey. He advised his trying his finger in the notch of the boot-jack where the boot goes, and the boot-jack would think it was his master's boot, and would shut the notch, and so would not bark. But you must not cry out, said he, no matter how much it hurts, until the princess gets downstairs. Then you can, and he will let go, and you must run or you will be left behind. So Sneed did, and when he put his finger in the notch, oh, how the boot-jack gripped him! But no sound did he make, only pushed the door open, and the beautiful princess started up, ran quickly downstairs, and jumped on the white horse. "'Let go!' screamed Sneed, for his finger was nearly pinched off. "'Bow-wow!' went the boot-jack at once, as loud as a cannon. Sneed scrambled downstairs, for the giant came rushing from his chamber, and in a moment they were all on the white horse and riding for life. The giant raved and stormed about, you may be sure, but it took a little time to discover how they had got off, before he let loose the winds to catch them. The horse ran so fast they could neither breathe nor see, but they heard a great noise behind, for the winds were coming, so many and so strong, that they blew everything to pieces as they went along. But before they could be caught or were dead for want of breath, they passed out of the giant's country and were safe. The king was so glad to get his beautiful daughter again that he gave the white monkey a nice house and garden all to himself. Sneed's finger came off, it had been so badly nipped, so the king gave him a gold finger and another nice house and garden all to himself. And they lived happily all their lives, for Sneed, having found how disagreeable it was to be hurt, never hurt anyone again. "'Which do they think handsomest in the black country?' asked Ethel. "'Black or white?' "'Black, I suppose. That is, a handsome black. "'Then why didn't the giant carry off a black princess?' End of chapter 7 Recording by Evan Smith Chapter 8 of Seven Autumn Leaves from Fairyland This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Jennifer Whisk. Seven Autumn Leaves from Fairyland by E. Cunningham. Chapter 8 Little Curly. Once in fairy tale times, there lived a little girl named Curly, because her hair curled so nicely and she was blue eyed and golden haired. She lived with her father and mother near the seashore, and her father built ships. Not far off there was another house, and in that were an old woman and a donkey, about whom no one knew anything, except that they were very much away from home. Now in truth this old woman was a naughty fairy, who caught all the boys and girls she could, 
turned them into seagulls, and sent them to live on a rock way off in the ocean, where they had to lay eggs, and every egg had a great diamond in it. But the old fairy could not catch anyone who did not come to her of their own accord, and although she had often asked Curly if she wouldn't have a ride on her donkey, Curly said no, and ran away, for the old creature was ugly and cross-looking, and besides, Curly's mother had told her not to go to her. But many were the little boys and girls she had caught by means of her donkey in other places, and a sad time they were having, off there on the lonely rock, ever so many thousand miles away. At last, one day, when Curly was picking cowslips in the meadow, she looked up and saw the old fairy. "'Come, child,' says she, "'and have a ride on the nice donkey.' Curly immediately turned to run home. "'And have some stuffed cakes,' said the old woman. Now Curly liked stuffed cakes rather too much, and when she heard that, she stopped to consider. The end of it was, in a little while, she was riding along on the donkey to the old woman's house. Very naughty, wasn't it, when her mother had told her never to go there. The cakes were very nice, but while she was eating, the wicked old woman slipped a white feather into her ear, and the next second there was a white gull, and little Curly was gone altogether. In her fright, she flew into the air, and immediately a fierce hawk began to follow her and drove her away from the green land, away, away, across the sea, until she was glad to rest on the Rock of Diamonds. There she found many other gulls, white, black, and brown, but they could not talk with each other. They could only scream and twitter, and it was a very cold and miserable place after the nice green land. Curly's mamma and papa soon missed her and looked through the fields and woods in vain. Then they began to fear the old fairy had caught her, but there was no use asking her. She would only call them bad names. So in their distress they remembered a good fairy who lived on a mountain a long way off, and was always ready to help good people. The builder put on his best shirt and shoes and hat, and hurried off with a piece of bread and an apple in his pocket, lest he should get hungry on the way. He had a long way to go, and by night he was hungry, and eat his bread. But he walked on all night, and when morning came, he was more hungry still, and pulled out his apple. Just then he saw a poor little crooked old man sitting on a bank by the roadside, and because he had a very kind heart, when he found the old man had had no dinner for three days, he gave him the apple and went on hungry. At noon he reached the fairy on the mountain. When she heard his story she considered a while. Then she brought him a little arrow trimmed with green feathers. Curly is somewhere on the sea, she said. Where? I don't know. But build a ship without a crossword. Put this arrow on the bow and sail where it points. It will carry you where she is. Then... You must yourself find her and catch her, and when you have her, to come back will be harder than to go. That's all the help any fairy can give you. After this long answer, not another word would she say to the poor papa. He took the arrow with a sad heart, for how could he build a ship soon enough, and that without a cross word? For the workmen were rude and quarrelsome, and many were the hard words given over the littlest boat they ever built. He traveled along, very tired chewing leaves and roots to stop his hunger, for he had nothing to eat. Halfway home he came to an old woman who had fallen and sprained her ankle. Ah, she cried, how shall I ever get home to my little grandchildren, and without me they will die. Tired as the good builder was, he took her up on his back and lugged her many a weary mile until at last he put her down at her own door. Good man, she said. I haven't much to give you, but here's a little box that may serve you some day. He thanked her, but when he looked in the box and found only a grain of barley, he laughed and thought it would never serve him much. However, he screwed on the top and carried it home to his wife. Before night he went to his shipyard, tired as he was, and laid down the keel for a little ship, and then returned home to bed, thinking that he would build her all himself, that there might be no cross words. In the morning, when he came with his axe and saw, behold, there was the little ship half built, and the little crooked man that had eaten his apple hard at work. The good builder saw at once it was one of the woodmen come to help him, so he said no word, but took off his coat and went to work. Never before did a little ship grow so fast, and when night came, she was all finished, tight and trig with masts and yards of ropes and sails. 
Before he could be thanked, the woodman was gone, but the builder never forgot to thank him night and morning for the rest of his life. The next day he hired some sailors, launched the ship into the water, fastened the arrow on the bow, bid good-bye to his wife, who kissed him many times and cried very much, to think she also could not go to find poor little Curly, and then away they sailed out of sight of land. They sailed and they sailed, days and nights, and the arrow turned on the bow if they went wrong, and at last, one bright morning, they came to the lonely rock with seagulls flying about it, and the sea dashing against its foot. Then the small boat was lowered into the water, and Curly's papa went ashore. He found the rock covered with eggs, but he looked in vain for Curly. She was not in any nook or cavern, and when he called, no voice answered. Only all the time the gulls circled about his head and screamed and fluttered. At last, one snow-white gull flew suddenly down upon his shoulder and then nestled in his breast. And then he knew this must be Curly. And when he looked at her closely, he found a little circle of curly feathers around her neck. Meantime, the sailors had broken the eggs and found a diamond in each, and were very glad. But the builder said they were witches' diamonds, and they had better have none of them. But the foolish sailors loaded their pockets with them. Then the builder called aloud to the seagulls that all could come that like with the ship, and they flew in a great cloud and settled on the masts and spars. But the builder was so afraid of losing Curly that he made a strong cage and kept her in the cabin all the time, and then they tried to sail home. But now came great storms, and they were blown hither and thither, for the old fairy knew that all her birds were with the ship, and she wanted to sink it with all the people, and then the birds would have to go back to the rock. Every day the good builder fed the birds, which the sailors did not like for they feared by and by there would not be enough food for them. So they wanted to shoot the birds, for all they cared for was to get home with their diamonds. But the builder would not let any bird be shot or driven away. He felt sure they were all little boys and girls like Curly. So they sailed on, always getting nearer home, though the storms tossed them about. Now the old fairy had made a great whirlpool in the sea, hoping to catch the ship in it and sink her, and they were sailing towards it, and began to hear a great roar like much water falling, and the ship was drawn by the water faster and faster to the whirlpool, and there was no wind to help them away, and now it seemed as if they must be swallowed up. But suddenly the gulls all rose into the air and spread their great wings. They seized on the ropes with their bills and flew and pulled and turned the ship, and then being many thousands, they at last towed her quite away into the safe ocean again but they had to fly so hard they were nearly dead with exertion, and for several days lay about the deck as if they could never fly again. Then came a pleasant wind, and they sailed on. By and by, one dark night, all saw a light ahead, and then the captain and sailors cried for joy, for they said, That is the lighthouse on our own land, and now we shall soon be safe at home. But in truth, it was a great flame made by the cruel fairy on a rock on purpose. The sailors might mistake it for their light, and so run the ship on the rocks. The seagulls, with their bright eyes, saw what it was. But how could they tell the captain, for they could not speak? They fluttered and twittered, and at last they all rose up from the ship, one great gray cloud of flapping wings, and flying to the flame, they flew against it and brushed it out with their breasts. Then... The sailors could no longer see the light, and they knew then it was not their lighthouse, which never went out, so they turned on one side and were saved. But the cruel old fairy was not done yet. When the ship had come within one hundred miles of home, she placed some rocks under the water, just so they could not be seen, and that time the seagulls could not see either, for the blue and smooth sea covered these rocks. And so they were sailing prosperously along. Suddenly, without warning, the good ship struck hard against the sharp rocks, and a hole was made, and the water rushed in, and she sank. The good builder had time to take Curly out of the cage, and having tied a string to her leg, he fastened her to his own neck so that she could sit on his shoulder, and by that time the ship sank so fast he was in the water. 
the sailors also having first put their diamonds in their pockets were in the water but alas the diamonds being witches diamonds were heavier than millstones and they were all drowned the builder would have been drowned too for it was a hundred miles from land and no man can swim a hundred miles unhelped but now the seagulls helped him they flew over his head and fastened their feet in his hair and held him up changing with each other as they came near the land the fairy sent her fierce hawk for if she could drown that good builder she would be glad and would have all her seagulls back again though they did not know that they only wanted to save him who had been so kind to them so when the fierce hawk swooped down to strike him hoping to tear out his eyes and kill him the birds flew above his head in a compact and solid mass through which he could not penetrate he tore their backs and broke their feathers and their blood fell into the sea but they would not open or give way and flew on and on always holding up the poor hard-pressed builder so that he could keep his chin above water and swim on little curly would have helped too but she was tied and could only sit still on her papa's shoulders at last his feet touched the solid ground and he was safe no sooner were they ashore than behold all the gulls turned again into little boys and girls just as they were when the wicked old fairy beguiled them away all except curly who poor thing sat on her papa's shoulder only a little white seagull still the little boys and girls were in great haste to return to their fathers and mothers but they stayed to thank the good builder first and to stroke and caress poor little curly and then they were off each to his home wondering as they ran why little curly could not be changed back also our poor tired builder hurried home too and his wife who had sat always by the window looking for him was so glad to see him that she cried now for joy but she cried still more when she found her little curly was only a white seagull they made a little warm nest for her and put a basket up the chimney and shut all the doors and windows that the cruel hawk might not get in and carry her off when the morning came lo there was a nice little egg in curly's nest but that only made the poor mother more sorry than ever what she said is my little girl never to be anything else than a bird and lay eggs then they sent off a message to the good fairy on the mountain to ask what they could do and why curly was not changed back like the others but the good fairy said that only good deeds could change her back and that the other seagulls had their deliverance for their three good acts first when they broke their bills pulling the ship from the whirlpool second when they burnt themselves in the fire and third when they bore the cruel strokes of the hawk all to save their friend and without knowing they were helping themselves then they considered how they could do good deeds but they could not go out for there was the great hawk always watching for a chance to seize poor curly and neither her papa nor mamma dared to leave her and so the days passed on and every day curly laid a little white egg and her mother put them away in a dark closet because she could not bear to see them at last they had eaten up all of their food first the meat went then the bread then the potatoes then they found there was nothing left and they were afraid to go out it seemed as if they must all die together they grew more and more hungry and now they had been three days without any food at all little curly lay on her side with her eyes half closed and her papa and mamma could no longer get up from the bed except to crawl along the floor just at the third day the good builder looking round the room as he thought for the last time saw on the shelf the little box from the old woman ah he thought there's a grain of barley i will give it to curly so he crawled across the room opened the box and took out the grain of barley lo in his hand it swelled into a beautiful barley cake as large as one's fist wife he cried and hastened to feed her but she said quickly you and curly and shook her head and shut her teeth tight and would by no means take any then he broke off a crumb and would have fed curly but she closed her bill and would sooner die than be fed when her dear mamma was dying of hunger so finding neither would eat he put the beautiful cake on the table and said we will all die together then 
Immediately the cake sank into the grain of barley. Then the good builder understood. With a cry of joy, he caught up the grain and, opening Curly's bill by force, popped it in, and their own little maiden stood there before them. Little Curly lost no time. She opened the door, no longer afraid of the great hawk, and ever so few minutes she was out and back again with her apron full of blackberries and wild raspberries, and they soon brought her mamma and papa round to life. Then she hurried to the next house and got bread and milk, and by night they were all strong enough to hug and kiss each other and talk over all that had happened and be as happy as such good people deserved. But as they got over their first happiness, they began to find themselves very poor. While Curly's papa was away on the sea, other builders of ships had come, and he could now get no work to do. Then all the money they had had before had been spent in buying things for the ship that was lost. So Curly picked berries, and her mother went out and washed, and her father cut wood in the forest, but they all together got very little to eat. One evening, as Curly was rummaging in the closets in the wall, she came on a whole heap of little white eggs. See, Mama, she cried, these nice eggs, why don't you cook them for supper? For she knew nothing of what she did and what happened to her when she was a little seagull. Oh, said her mother, perhaps they are mice's eggs and you must not touch them. But just then, one rolled from the heap and falling on the floor broke and out fell a brilliant diamond. At first they could not believe their eyes, but when they broke the other eggs one after the other, and each held another and another, then there was joy and happiness, you may believe. Now their troubles were over. They sold the diamonds one by one, and when they were all sold, there was so much money that it could not be counted. They had a nice, pleasant house and garden, and horses and cows and sheep, and what they liked better than all, they always had something for the poor travelers. And so, after all, it turned out very well that little Curly became a seagull. But if the good builder and his wife had not been so kind to all they met, all the more when poor, ragged, and miserable, and if they had eaten up the cake when so hungry, instead of each trying to make the others eat, then perhaps it would not have turned out so well. There isn't any fighting in that story, says Jack. You ought to tell another. Oh, it's better than fighting ever so much, and Curly is the dearest darling of them all. All the girls in chorus. End of chapter 8 Recording by Jennifer Whisk End of Seven Autumn Leaves from Fairyland by E. Cunningham